Take your Bible, turn to Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 28. If you would, please stand in reverence to the reading of God's Word. The Bible says, through faith, he, now who's the he? Moses. Now remember, two weeks ago, we studied the faith of Moses' parents. And then last week, my favorite passage in Hebrews 11, we began by looking at the faith of Moses. And we saw where Moses refused the lords of Egypt to be identified with the suffering of God's children. And then it says in verse 28, through faith he, being Moses, kept the Passover. And the sprinkling of blood, lest he, not they, he, that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. Let's pray. Father, glorify yourself in what you do in this time. In Jesus' name. And all God's children said, amen. You may be seated. Well, as you stay there in Hebrews 11, I want you to turn with me to Exodus chapter 12. When you look at Hebrews 11, verse 28, here's what you're going to see in verse 28, 29, and 30. You're going to see the faith of Moses being unpacked for you and I. Now remember, as I've said before, God is taking each of these Old Testament individuals and he's trying to teach what is faith as God sees faith? In other words, what's faith look like lived out as God sees and defines faith? Now, what you're going to find in verse 28 is it's faith that brings us out. Then you're going to find next week in verse 29, it's faith that allows us to go through. Because we're going to see next week, it was the faith of Moses whereby they went across the Red Sea. And then in verse 30, you're going to find in two weeks, it is faith that allowed them to go in. And this is the faith that brought down the walls of Jericho where they could enter into the land of Canaan. And so God focuses on this man's faith as a evidence of what he deems to be true faith. And so when you find this passage in verse 28, through faith he kept the Passover. Now you say, well, what kind of faith or what depth of faith did it take to keep the Passover? Well, I'm here to tell you probably of all the passages that we're going to look at in Hebrews 11, I've come to believe that this passage... Uh, probably speaks of the greatest depth of faith of any of them in Hebrews 11. And I want to show you why that is. I went back and restudied all this out and really had a great time with it. But I want you to see with me first, face revelation. Now, I've done this with every one of these, and I want to remind you again. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the... So therefore, faith begins what? When the word is revealed, you have nothing to faith unless God is spoke. And so what we find, again with this one, like we've had with all the others, we find that God initiates the faith through a word to Moses. Now, listen, this word would be to the people of Israel as well, but I want you to hear me. It's to Moses, and through Moses... It's a word to the people. But God spoke to Moses. And that's one of the reasons God put his finger on Moses' faith. Because if Moses didn't believe what God said, the people weren't going to believe what God said. And so what we find here is face revelation. Now I want you to see a couple things about what God revealed to Moses. He begins this revelation about the Passover concerning the time. Notice what it says, the mercy seen in the month. How many agree the Passover was to celebrate and to 
protect the people through God's mercy. And so this is all a work of God's mercy. But I want you to see how God even gave his mercy in the month in which God deemed that this was to take place. Notice what it says in verse 1 and 2. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Now, this month we know from other passages in the taking of the Passover was what was called in the Jewish vernacular the month of Abib. And you say, why is that important? Because it's our month of April. And so the month of Abib was the month in which God said to Moses, and I want you to see this, God literally changes the Jewish calendar in one moment. And he says, now this month will be the first month of your calendar year. In other words, when you celebrate this Passover, when you do what I tell you to do in taking of this Passover and slaying the Passover lamb, he said, this will be the beginning of the beginning for you. And I want you to listen today. It was the grace and mercy of God that allowed Jesus Christ in April, on the day of the Passover, it was the day in which the Lord Jesus was crucified. And on that day, because of what Jesus did, when you and I were identified with his death, burial, and resurrection through our salvation and faith and repentance, can I tell you, your life began right then. So I want to tell you when your life began. The day God saved you. And so it's the, and even the Jews of this day will say, that the month of Obeeb is the month of new beginnings. And so this shows the mercy of God. And so Abraham, now listen, had to trust God that when God said this would be the first month of your year, Abraham had to trust God to the point that he would now institute that among the people. Now aren't you glad they wasn't Baptists? They'd have had to have committee meeting after committee meeting after committee meeting to get that done. Except for liberty. I'm glad for liberty. Y'all say amen. amen. But in other words, he had to trust God and what God was doing. And so what we find here is the revelation of God began with God showing his mercy in the month. But I want you to see, secondly, the mandate seen in the message. Because God's going to tell Moses this. He's going to tell Moses, Moses, I'm going to send my death angel. And I'm going to remove the firstborn of all of Egypt. And I'm going to bring death upon them. But here is your provision. Now, when God gave Moses that mandate, I want you to see something. Moses was convinced of God's declaration. Now let me ask you a question. Did Moses have anything in history past or what he was seeing now to be able to justify by the sight of his eyes that the death angel was going to sweep through Egypt and take every firstborn? I would say to you, no. Did Moses have anything to go on other than God said it. You see, the, the reality of faith is this. It don't matter what your circumstances are. It don't matter what's going on around you. Faith allows God to say, and when God says, you are convinced it's true. You see, this is the key. This is one of the reasons God put his finger on Moses' faith and didn't say Israel took the Passover Moses took the Passover because it began with Moses. Moses had to be convinced that what God said was true or the people would have never been convinced of what God said being true. And so Moses became convinced of God's declaration. So when God said, this is what I'm going to do and this is what you must do, Moses said, I believe God. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. 
Think about it. God tells Israel, take a lamb, slay the lamb, put the blood on the, door, the top and on the side of the doors, and don't leave your home. Now, how many of you agree in human thinking? That makes no sense at all. But yet, here's the reality. It was only when Moses trusted God that the people would trust God, and it was only when the people trusted what God said to Moses would the people be spared of their firstborn. You see, it took the revelation of God. And God gave Moses this mandate. (coughs) And Moses became convinced of his declaration. But here's the second thing. Moses not only became convinced of his declaration, Moses became convinced of his deliverance. How many of you agree today Moses would have never, ever, Follow through with this if Moses didn't trust God that God would do exactly what God said he would do. Can I tell you why a lot of people stay lost? They're not willing to believe that God will deliver them. Because they don't see they need deliverance. And because they don't see they need deliverance, they don't believe God will deliver them. Or God needs to deliver them. But yet God has made a mandate, and it's very clear, that all have sinned. And God's made a mandate, and it's very clear, that every lost man, woman, boy, and girl is bound in sin. And every man, woman, boy, and girl needs deliverance from sin. But here's the reality. It's not anything man can do. It's trusting what God did. And so Moses not only had to be convinced concerning God's declaration about this, Moses had to be convinced that God would deliver them and so Moses through the revelation of God became completely 100% convinced of what God said is true now listen to me just a minute the reason so many Christians walk in defeat is they have such a hard time Allowing themselves to be convinced that God said that when he saved you, you're already victorious in Christ Jesus. We have a hard time of being convinced that God not just is delivering us, God has delivered us. We have a hard time being convinced. That God is everything God said he would be to us, for us, and in us. You see, it was this faith alone in Moses that became the faith whereby the children of Israel began to walk. If Moses wouldn't have trusted God, Israel would have never trusted God. And so, here becomes the face revelation. So faith began with the revelation of God. Now, so, so remember what it said in Hebrews eleven twenty eight. 28. By faith, he kept the Passover. But now watch. This faith had to go further. Because now what do we find? We find secondly, faith's requirement. God can give you revelation. But how many of you agree today that in his revelation, many times there are requirements in which you and I must walk in? So in other words, watch what he tells. He tells Moses in verse 3, here's the first requirement of walking in faith towards the Passover. He said, speak ye unto the congregation of Israel, say, In the tenth day of this month, there shall take unto them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. So what do we find? The first requirement God gave to Moses is the proclamation of the lamb. 
Now remember, if Moses didn't believe what God said, here's what Moses would have said. Probably nothing. Or Moses would have said, listen, we better get out of here. But they couldn't get out of there. And so in other words, Moses had to trust God. And when Moses trusted God, here's what he told the people. This is what God said, and you better listen. Because this is your only hope and your only way out. And so, faith of Moses not only trusted what God said, but was willing to proclaim what God said. Now, I'm not very smart. But if the people... did not esteem Moses in a very high favor. Do you understand when Moses went out and told the people, this is what you must do? What would have happened if the people didn't trust Moses that he heard from God? Moses would have probably done it against his own life. And so here's what happens with faith. Faith, when you walk in faith, faith will let you step out on nothing other than the Word of God. Not knowing what the outcome will be, but what God said. You see, this is the glorious part of faith. Faith allows you to step out on what God said and trust God that God will bring forth the fruit of what He said. And so it's not just, listen, a lot of people say, well, I believe the Bible. Now, y'all going to love me say amen. Here's how much of the Bible you believe, how much you walk in. I mean, I can take any passage of this Bible and preach it and say, this is what God said. We go, amen. But how much of it are you walking in? See, that's how much we truly believe. Because faith will act upon what God says. Faith is not passive. Faith is active. And so Moses, gave, God gave this requirement, speak unto the congregation of Israel, say. So there's the proclamation. But notice the provision of the land. Here's the second requirement. It says in verse 3, And they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. So here we have in Exodus 12. We have the second requirement to Moses' faith in what he's going to proclaim. And here it is. Not only is Moses going to proclaim the truth about the lamb that God spoke of, but Moses is now going to talk about the provision of the lamb. In other words, here's what Moses is saying. This lamb is your only sufficient provision. You have nothing else. So in other words, Moses was convinced and because Moses was convinced, the people became convinced. And the people did what Moses said. Now, what was Moses saying about this lamb? Well, simply this. You're to have a lamb for every household. And if the household is too small that one household can eat of the whole lamb, then you're to combine the household. But here's the picture. There's a lamb for every person. And no person will be without. No matter how small the family or how large the family. God said there's a lamb for every... Listen, I'm going to tell you something today. Jesus Christ was the lamb that was provided for every man, woman, boy, and girl. Excuse me, Calvinist. <laughs> Some of my Calvinist friends are going to get mad at me. I'm going to get my phone blown up tomorrow, I know. But God provided a lamb. And it was for every house. And so Moses had to trust God in God's requirement of faith. 
the proclamation of the Lamb, the provision of the Lamb, and the purity of the Lamb. Couldn't just be any Lamb. Notice what God said. Your Lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep and from the goats. In other words, so Moses communicates this to the people. He says, now, this lamb is your only hope. And not only is this lamb your only hope, but it can't be a lamb. It's got to be a spotless male lamb of the first year. Now, y'all know all the types and shadows that this portrays upon the Lord Jesus. He without sin became our sin. He of the firstborn of God. I mean, listen, we could go on and on and on. But here's what I want you to understand. It took faith to trust what God said when they had no evidence what God said he was going to do was going to happen. But it took faith to not only take a lamb from their fold and slay it. But I want you to hear me. To be without spot would be this. For you to take your prized lamb. I know y'all go to shows and stuff. But take your prized lamb. The most perfect lamb. And that's the one that you got to slay. Just because you believe what God said when you have no evidence of it. So let me ask you a question. Did God give his best? Did God give his priceless lamb? Then can I ask this a question? Why in the world do we think that we can skate through life given the leftovers of our time and the leftovers of our affection and the leftovers of our attention and think God's okay with that. See, most people's Christian walk is a walk of convenience not a walk of surrender are y'all with me you see it took faith to give themselves to God's requirement now let me show you thirdly face reception but I want to tell you I saw this I about jumped out of my chair in my office. I want you to go to verse 3 with me. Look at it. Speak ye unto the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day thou shalt take unto them a man a lamb. Y'all see that word, a lamb? Listen, if you ever underline your Bible, here's your time. A lamb, underline it. Look at verse 4. And if the household be little for the lamb. All right, so now in verse 3. A lamb. Verse 4, the lamb. But look at verse 5, your lamb. Hey, I want you to hear me today. Moses said you have to take a lamb. But because it's got to be the best of what you got, it's the lamb. And then when you take the lamb, it becomes your lamb. In other words, it's the one that gave his life for yours. You see, there's the reception of faith. Because for Israel to do what God required for them to do, they had to receive not only what God said, 
through Moses, but they had to receive the provision that God made for them in a lamb, and they had to identify themselves with that lamb as being their lamb. In other words, here's the way God saw it. God said, when you slew this lamb, your lamb, then oh, here's what you're doing. You are in your stead, in behalf of your firstborn, in behalf of your family, you are slain your lamb that you've identified with. In other words, your lamb has took your place. So how do you see Jesus? A lamb that was slain? The lamb that was slain? Oh, I wanted to tell you today, he is a lamb that was slain, and he is the only lamb that was slain. But that ain't going to do you any good. That makes you smart. That don't help you a bit. Is he your lamb that was slain? Have you identified with him in death, burial, resurrection, whereby you understand that when Jesus died, you died. He died for you, but he died as you. He's your lamb. So you see face revelation, you see face requirement, you see face reception, and now you see face response. How many agree faith always demands a response? Look at verse 6. You have three commands that God gives here through Moses. The first command is the command of examination. You look at verse 6, and you shall keep it unto the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Why did they have to keep it unto the 14th day? Remember, they had to take it out from among the flock in verse 5. In verse 6, they had to keep it unto the 14th day. Remember, they took it out of the flock on the 10th day. So for three and a half days, They had to examine that lamb. Why? To make sure it was without spot and without blemish. I want you to get this. They took their lamb out amongst all the other lambs. And their eyes for three and a half days was not fixed on all the other lambs. It was fixed on their lamb. You think it's coincidence that after three and a half years of Lord Jesus' earthly ministry, that even Pilate, a heathen, looked upon Jesus and three times said, I find no fault in him. Command of examination. Command of application. <clears throat> and they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and the upper post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. Now remember what 11.28 said. By faith, Moses kept the Passover, and then God identifies a second work of faith or a second response to faith and the sprinkling of the blood. So in other words, it took Moses having faith in what God said to even keep the Passover, but it also took faith for Moses to sprinkle the blood on the doorpost. And this is the application. Now listen. We know from other texts in Scripture that the Passover lamb, God said, was to be slain at around 3 o'clock in a Jewish day. We know also the Bible teaches 
that in that same moment, the high priest would slay the lamb in the temple. And we also know that it was around 3 o'clock that Jesus breathed his last breath. Could God have spoke any louder? But here's what's amazing. When the high priest would take the lamb for the temple worship on Passover, Day of Atonement, would coincide. Here's what the high priest would slay when he would slit that lamb's throat. He'd say, it is finished. What was the last words the Lord Jesus said? Could God have spoken any louder? And then they were to apply with hyssop the blood upon the upper post and the side post. Why hyssop? Because hyssop God would deem to be what's used when you certify a covenant by blood. Every covenant had to be certified by blood. And so hyssop was what God said would be used to certify a covenant. So in other words, when they applied that blood to the upper post and to the side post, here's what God did. God entered into a covenant with them that they would not see death. And them applying that with hyssop was them saying, we receive the covenant promise God made to us. Are y'all getting this or not? I'm having fun with this. I mean, there, what a glorious picture we have. How many agree when God saved you, he entered into a covenant relationship with you? How many agree it was sealed by blood? I'm telling you right now, it's the Lord Jesus and his blood. Now, now watch this. He said up on the upper post and the side post, but not on the threshold or the bottom post of the door. Why not the bottom post? Because the blood was never to be stepped on. But yet the Bible says in Hebrews 10 that if we willfully sin against the knowledge of truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for our sins, but a fearful looking unto judgment. And hear what it says. It says that we go against the, the Spirit of God and we trample under our foot the blood of the covenant. Good gracious. You see the examination. You see the application. It took obedience of faith in both. But then you see a third command. The command of consumption. Watch what it says. Moses tells the people. Bottom verse 7, wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire, unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs, and they shall eat it. How much were they to eat? All of it. How much of the Lord Jesus did you receive? You remember in John's gospel, the Lord Jesus told the crowd, unless you drink of my blood and eat of my flesh, you have no part with me. What did they do in response? They left. They were offended. And Jesus even looked at his own disciples and said, Are you going to leave me as well? So what was the Lord Jesus saying? You must fully identify with me. You must fully receive who I am as Lord and King and Lamb. In other words, here's the thing. You can't go through, you can't be saved part of Jesus. Either you received him all for who he is or you didn't receive him at all. And so, you see, face revelation, you see face requirement, you see face reception, face response. Now look fifthly at face readiness. Verse 11, 
and thus shall you eat it, with your loins girded, and your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. <coughs> it is the Lord's Passover. What was God telling him? Now, you have to understand, when Jews ate, they didn't eat with shoes up on their feet. In their mind, that was considered taboo. But God said, when you eat this lamb, you're to eat it with shoes up on your feet, your staff in your hand. In other words, you're to eat it ready to go. Why? Because God was going to bring the death angel through, remove every firstborn of Egypt. Pharaoh was going to come to the place, get these folks out of here. I want them out of here now. And God said, you better be ready to go. So here's what faith does. Faith lets you get in on God's deliverance for you. But true faith, if you got in on God's deliverance, true faith will bring you to the place of being ready to obey whatever God has for you next. Do you live your life every day eager to obey? Or does God have to pull it out of you? Ready. Ready. Lastly, face rest. Hebrews eleven twenty eight concludes this way. Lest he that destroyed the firstborn should be touched then. Watch what it says. For I will pass through the land of Egypt, verse 12, this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. They had rest in God's promise. You say, what do you mean God's promise? Well, number one, God said that if they put the blood upon the doorpost, the death angel would pass over and they would not be touched. But can I give you another promise of God that I believe was the promise that helped Israel and Moses to trust God to do what God said? And you say, what promise is that? How many of you agree God promised through Abraham the Abrahamic covenant? And how many agree that Abrahamic covenant would be always handed down through the firstborn? So if... God swept through and took the firstborn not only of Egypt but of Israel, then here's what would happen. The cut covenant that God made with himself that he said he would fulfill upon himself and upon his own character and upon his own nature would have not been fulfilled. And therefore Moses knew that God wouldn't take the firstborn of Israel because God couldn't do what God said he would do. So they could be at rest. Now, I'm not very smart, Pope. But if you knew God was going to sweep through Egypt, where you live, and take every firstborn, and you're a mother of a firstborn, I wonder. How many could have sat down that night said, well, we're safe. Let's go to bed, honey. Do you trust that when God entered into covenant with you, that nothing can touch you unless God allows it. I wished a bunch of folks would have believed that when COVID went through. 
Not only were they at rest in God's promise, they were at rest in God's protection. Now listen to what I'm about to say. It wasn't the house, and it wasn't the people that God looked at and told the death angel to pass over. It was the blood. It wasn't what the people did. It was the blood. It wasn't who the people were. It was the blood. If an Israelite had not put blood upon that doorpost, it wouldn't have mattered if they were of Israel or of Egypt. Their firstborn would have died that night. What are you saying? I say in this, the only reason you and I are protected from the condemnation of sin, the only reason you and I are protected from the judgment that's coming upon this world, the only reason you and I are protected from a place called hell is not because of you, not because of your prayer, not because of your baptism, not because of your church membership, not because of your works. It is the blood. It wasn't the life of the Lamb that saved the people. It was the death of the Lamb. Folks, listen to me. A lot of people, here's what they think. I believe in Jesus. I believe what I read in the Gospels of how he lived in sinless perfection. I believe that the Christ lived the way the Bible says he lived. I believe he did all those miracles. I believe he rose the dead. I believe he did this. I believe he did that. I believe he was crucified. I believe he rose again. But it's not the life of Christ in the Gospels that saves anybody. It's the death and burial and resurrection of Christ. Moses, by faith. Verse 28 again. Moses, by faith. Kept the Passover. Had nothing to go on but what God said. Moses, by faith, was convinced that he, as well as Israel, had to sprinkle that blood upon the upper post and side post of their door. Even though God had never asked that before. And Moses, by faith, trusted that God wouldn't touch the firstborn of Israel. And was able to rest in a night that was a night of death. God, that's how you see faith? It is. It's how he sees it. Father, I stand amazed that your word, your truth, and Father, this very faith that you have outlined here with Moses, is the faith that you gifted us with when you saved us.
Father, we have something Moses didn't have. We have the indwelling, enabling person of the Holy Spirit. that enables us to live by this faith. So, Father, how much more should it be real in us? Father, continue to teach us what it means when it says the just shall live by faith. And I'll give you the praise, the honor, and the glory in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, Amen.